Welcome again to Club Talk Hurling, brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. If you want to get the jerseys on screen here or any other of the retro jerseys, go to OrgaRetro.com, put in the promo code OurGame and you'll get 15% off. Michael Verney, it was quite a weekend, but we're probably going to start off on one of the games that was most won most comfortably, and that was Waterford, uh, the Waterford final, where Bally Gunner, let's be honest, live on telly, battered passage, 123 to 9 points. Now, it's not as if uh, Bally Gunner hadn't already got revenge for the 2013 county final loss in 2016, but this was, look, let's be honest, let's call a spade a spade here. It was, it was an absolute beatdown, and nothing typified that anymore than seeing the, uh, the, fight, the, the scoring in terms of from play. 118 to two points, that kind of summed it all up. Ah, uh, yeah, I was down at the passage semi final against Mount Sion the week before, and they were brilliant. But you could see that there was going to be there was a massive gulf in class. It was a brilliant game because it was high scoring and entertaining. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't an unbelievable amount of class on show, shall we say. It didn't look like either side would have enough that they could hurt Bally Gunner in any way. And it it just it just felt like the floodgates were going to open at any time. Now it didn't open to the point where it was you know four thirty or something like that, but it was just constant from Valley Gunner over and over and over again. Um, kind of kind of said it on the on the, the preview show on Thursday. Thought Philip Matt he'd sit back in front of Liam Flynn and Barry Coughlin and clean up between the two of them, and it's it's exactly what happened. I, I have to say about Barry Coughlin as well. I know he had a man close to him. I think he's so maligned. Like I think he's so effective in what he does, and he he's always very good in the ball as well. Philip Manny as well kind of showed like you'd you'd hope maybe I know he's still probably working up in Dublin, but you'd hope that um. There might be a little U-turn there, even for the two or three month season. Mm, with after the game, though, after the game, he was asked about that, and he was kind of almost like, "Not a hope." Like, and even he, he, no, he, no, no, he never said no. He yeah, never said no. He, he said he, today it was about Bally Gunner. I, I know, I, I, but I, you know the way, like you read someone's that. reactions, you read his reactions, and it was like, <laughs> "No, like, I mean, it's it's not really on his radar." That's what I took from it. And even even, even Liam Cattle had kind of been asked before the game about would he do a U-turn and he was like he seems very definite on his decision. I do agree with you that he'd be a serious asset because his use of the ball is brilliant which is something that actually typified the Ballygunner performance once again. Like Passage were hoping to get in their face, hope they'd hit long ball and let their sweeper clean up and a couple of times that did work but in general they're just too clever at moving the ball around even if it's like Paddy Levy with the sort of little spooned efforts where he constantly does the one-handed Paddy Levy brick flick. Uh, but they were just too comfortable on the ball and you know like on a, on a nice fine day like that as well it just seemed inevitable like Desi, Desi Hutchinson had a couple of beautiful moments little chop flicks up off the ground got a couple of nice points as well and I agree with you about Barry Coughlin if they could convince him to go back in with the county also now they have Conor Prunty there and obviously we both rate him quite highly but Barry Coughlin I think he was often I think he was measured as the fastest player on the panel there a couple of years ago. So, I mean, you can never have too many fast players that know how to shut lads down. So, uh, but one of the things that stood out also was a tweet from Keith Hogan. It's not the only tweet we're going to have from the Clara player here, Clara and Kilkenny. He tweeted that Bally Gunner win Watford County Championships. So what? Nine, nine county championships in the last 12 years and not one club all Ireland. Only one Munster Championship to show for it from nine attempts. Big fish, small pond. What do you make of that? Uh, I think it's an interesting one. I think you could probably put them in the same category as probably like a Turles Sarsfield as well. Without being smart, Turles only won one monster. Actually, there's a lot of comparisons between the two of them. Uh, not even winning an All Ireland Bally Gunner, they haven't even been to an All Ireland final. They'd say the same as as Turles for the talent that they have. I just I really wonder like about teams like Bally Gunner, uh, Bally Hale, Cara Finn, like. Their, their bigger picture at the start of the year they're thinking all Ireland's are provincial silver that's what they're thinking and they've won a county title but it's a long way to wait, have to wait until they cha- get a chance that you know they, they would feel very let down against Burson Lee last year it's a long long time to be waiting to get a chance to get back there again now all signs would suggest that they should they should coast through Waterford to a fair extent next year but they definitely haven't for the talent that they have and the slick game plan that they have and how kind of it's it's an inter-county system with an inter-county squad of sorts and they should be definitely they should definitely have more silver in the bank than they have there's i don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever yeah and like you know the one time that they it seemed like they were going to kick on to that next level and get to like 
Actually, no, I'm actually thinking of, of Owler de Bala as well. Do you remember that time when Owler de Bala, after years and years of trying to get through Leinster and then they beat our Kula team in the final, they got through and they lose that semi final? It was almost like they had reached the goal that they'd been going for for so long and it was probably right at the end of this particular team's peak and they just kind of, you know, almost declared on that. Whereas the only, the, oh, the only, I, I, I can't agree with you. The only oh. thing they came into in the Pearshick side, that was an absolute belter of a semi-final and they should have beaten them in normal time and ended up getting beaten in extra time, I think, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, but thereafter, uh, I mean, it was almost like that season was the end of it. Yeah, no, well, they, they were of that kind of age profile and they'd been beaten in so many finals up until that. But for, when you go down, man for man, down through what Bally Gunner have and just how... Like, they don't concede big scores. They're set up not to concede big scores. And the way they play, and like, even like Stephen O'Keefe were just pinging balls to cornerbacks. There was no, I don't, I don't remember really seeing, it, seeing a long ball been hit. So there's that sort of style that they're playing. They're setting, setting up the score as much as they can while also keeping tight. Like, that's, that's an inter county system. There's, there's inter county teams that don't have systems that are as efficient as that. And to say that they only have one Munster title. For that and for the talent that they have, Stephen O'Keefe, Shane O'Sullivan, uh, the three Mahonies, Desi Hutchison, uh, and many, many more is yeah. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Like if they don't eventually get to an All Ireland, they definitely look back and be very disappointed for what they've had, and it will always be thrown at them unless they get an All Ireland. That yeah, you you dominate Waterford. There weren't any particularly strong teams in Waterford at the time. You're beaten in a Munster final, beaten in a couple of semi finals. And he won one, but you never got to where you should have got to or where you think you should have got to. Yeah, they definitely should have more. I think they should have an All-Ireland by now. But are they suited to more to summer hurling? Because they have these, this system whereby they work the ball around the flanks. And that works beautifully when the weather is okay. But then when it gets to the muck and the dirt and all that, as we saw last year in the Munster final, it didn't work as well. And it came under pressure. And obviously they were up against the Burris Lee team that... Fine, that Burris Lee team just got knocked out at the weekend, but a Burris Lee team where everything was more or less kind of working as planned, but they're dogs of war and they brought them down into the trenches. And that's probably something that has caught Bally Gunner out once or twice. And they've had some big scalps too, you know, they've beaten big teams, but they've lost games that they, they probably shouldn't have. Yeah, if, uh, if the split season means that club championships are going to be pay played off, you know, July, August, September, you find it nigh and impossible to see them being beaten in Waterford on a any sort of decent sort of a sod. It's more like we were brought down in Park Arena that day for the Munster final. It was it was sticky, very, very sticky, really, really tough conditions. And that sort of short game can break down a bit more. You find it like, I, I didn't see it being broken down at any stage yesterday. There wasn't even any sort of missed passes or anything like that. It would definitely suit them for games to be played at that time for this time of the year it just and they're all really really mobile players as well but listen they have to wait a good while before they get the chance to go and do what they think they should be doing again Desi, Desi Hutchinson said after you know the goal was a Munster title after being beaten last year in the Munster final or get back on a run and you have to wait a good while you just don't know what will happen in the year maybe there'll be a couple of big injuries maybe a couple of lads step aside you just you just don't know but they're a, they're a seriously well-oiled machine and I'm sure they'll be gunning to get back at a provincial on All-Ireland honours in the next year or two years Yeah absolutely and let us know on our game.ie if you think that uh, Bally Gunner should have done more or your thoughts on the Watford final just something that stood out to me over the weekend when I was looking at the, the lineup on TV so you, ha you had a couple of games on, on RT, so it was Mayo football quarterfinals. And then in the Hurling, you had the Waterford final, which it is a county final and that's always important, but it's n it definitely wasn't a glamour tie because everyone expected Bally Gunner to win that game well. And of course, if it ended up being a shock win for Passage, it's an unbelievable thing to have on TV. But nine times out of 10, Bally Gunner are gonna win this game. I think they were 10 to one on before the game. And then the other game that was on in the um, just after that on TG Carr was a quarter final in Monaghan, which I'm not sure how much appeal there would be for that across the width of the country. But what what also um, what I started thinking about was Kilkenny. They're broadcasting their own games, and you can imagine they're making a decent amount of money out of that. Tipperary. They're broadcasting their all their games, and you'd imagine it's actually more profitable for them to do that. And across the board, you're wondering, like, our county board's now thinking there's no point in us selling our games to TG Carr, to RTE, whoever it might be. Now, I've heard figures been uh, floated around in the past about how much a county board gets. 
in, ter in terms of uh, from the TV companies if a game has been broadcast live or deferred. So I've heard that five grand is what a county board will get for a live game, two and a half deferred. Now that's not absolutely gospel. These, these are the figures I've sort of heard. And you'd sort of think that, okay, that's fine. It's compensating for gate receipts that you'd imagine from people who just say, I'll sit at home and I'll watch these games. But is it going to get to a stage now where across the board, county boards are going to be broadcasting all their own games. They're going to be getting sponsors in. They're going to be getting people paying to watch these games per unit. And even when crowds come back, they're going to be selling games to, like, let's say, an awfully person who's living in Australia, and they're now able to pay a fiver or a tenner to watch the match, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, the county board is thinking, why on earth would I sell this to a TV company? Because I can get all the sponsorship, and they're all, all the screens are branded with the sponsors, and I can get the direct revenue from uh, people watching pay-per-view. I think TV companies are going to struggle to get big games. Yeah, I think it's one of the things, one of the, well, it's a positive development, I have to say, from all the Kennedy Board's point of view during COVID, that everybody got their streaming services up to date. Um, I think everybody's fairly modernised. Even any little problems that there were in the first week or two of streaming has kind of been sorted since. And they realise it's a really, uh, it's a really beneficial revenue stream for them. And they can basically take in money from anywhere in the world. So you can watch, like, when before would you have ever been able to watch you know, you watched four tip quarterfinals yesterday without being there. You maybe would have been able to get to two of them, but now you're able to watch four of them, no matter where you are in the world, which is unbelievable for you and I'm sure many, many others. Um, so it's gonna, it will probably get harder for TG Carr and RT to source games. It was like the immediate thing that came to mind last night with the TG Carr having a, a Monaghan quarterfinal on, which with, don't get me wrong, those games deserve to get coverage as well, but they were probably maybe sexier or more attractive matches on at the same time. And you're wondering, like the Ballyboden game with Rahini that went to extra time, or the Nafina and Ballymun game, where you have you know a load of really high profile names on both sides. And like I listen, I don't know the exact scenario, but I'd imagine Dublin wanted to keep that game for themselves to some extent. And um, and they're fully within their, their rights to do that. So that could be a struggle for TG Carr and RT to have games, um, to get those big high profile games that are going to warrant uh, national TV coverage. But uh, it'd be interesting to see if the split season does come in, um, what way different counties will go. Like, say, like Wexford had a good few games on TV. So they obviously have their streaming services which i think they made, they made i remember reading an article that my colleague in independent did colin keys they were getting really good viewing figures or whatever off them but like if you play the wexford championship hurling early and there's not that much hurling on at that time of the year then you're more likely to get televised games if it's a matter of whether they want those televised games or not um so it's going to be in, it's going to be interesting little struggle there uh tg Carr have been have been unbelievable rt are kind of but I've been smart only really getting into the club game now, been, been honest. TG Carr have been on real, so I'd imagine everything will be done to accommodate them and to make sure that their coverage and the games that they have stay to a high level. But it's there's going to be a fair bit of uh, jiggery pokery there to make sure that everybody's happy. Yeah, and it's, it's often when the provincial championships come online that uh, the, the crowds get even bigger in terms of who's watching on TV. So I would imagine that the, let's say, the Leinster Council and Munster Council and so on they would maybe have rights over those and maybe it would be easier for TG Kehr and, and RT to get back involved with those sort of games. So it remains to be seen. And it might be just the case even that county boards say, well, look, that figure you were charging before, we're not going to be able to do it anymore. We're going to need to, you know, get a bit of a, a higher price to make this worth our while. Let's be honest, we're in a, capital, a capitalist world. That's the way things operate. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that in the future. Next then, Unbelievably dramatic weekend in the Tipperary uh, Hurling Championship. The quarterfinals were on. Just quickly to run through the, um, the teams that are left over after that. You're going to have Nina Airog against Lockmore Castellani in one semi final and Kiladangan against Drummond Inch in the other. So that's two North teams against two Mid teams. We'll start off with Kiladangan against Toomey Vara. Now, this is the first game I watched over the weekend, and Kiladangan beat Toom 316 to 18 points. One of those things where at times it felt that Kiladangan made hard work of it. An awful lot of wasteful shooting that kept Toom in the game. Uh, Willie Connors got a goal from a sideline, came all the way in from about the 45-65, the and I think um, there was men on the line, but it was one of those things where a couple of people went up for a high ball, missed it, bounced, went in past Joey Malachny, who was on the line. So very unfortunate there, could happen to anyone. 
Jack Delaney gave an absolute exhibition for Tumi Vara in full forward. Now, he would have been an underage player a couple of years ago. Very good player. But unfortunately, Tumi Vara never looked like scoring a goal and came up short in this game. Kiladang and very slick. We, we've talked about it week after week after week that they have such a good, like without having any superstars, they have such a good spread of quality players across the team. And it feels like they could probably kick on another level again. So they're definitely a challenger going into going into the county semi-finals. And after losing two finals in recent seasons, they might be in a position to kick on. An interesting one with Dara Egan over the weekend. He was on the sideline with Kiladangan for the senior game, but for the intermediates, he was actually involved. Yeah, he was the, he was the goalie. It went into it went into a penalty shootout at the end, and he saved the penalty. There's great um, there's great video footage online. You can't. I was actually just listening to it. I wasn't really watching it. But I was listening to the coverage online, and um, there's a couple of boys going absolutely mad on the Kiladangan line, and a boy egg, and that's all you can hear. And he pulls off a save, and then he rattles the the winner. Then just after, but Kiladangan are an interesting one. Uh, you mentioned about the whites, like they do. If it clicks on a given day, and it obviously didn't click in last year's county final, but if it clicks on a given day, they could be really, really hard to stop. Like if they're able to limit it to seven or eight whites in a big game, they could put up a colossal score and could be very, very hard to stop. I know you watched all four games as well. Like <laughs> there's no point saying any different. We probably all thought Turles were number one in in our power rankings of uh, Tipperary. It's probably Turles one and Boris Lee two. Like. That must have been a crazy game. I know Jake Morris got three goals, but Turles had a point scored at half time. Just talk me through that game. That I, I kind of said Nina had it in them. I didn't know whether it would come, but that's that's a big shock. The thing with Nina, right, and they won this game three twelve to one eight. Is this would be quintessential Nina to beat Turles, the form team, to win a county semi final, look unbelievable, and then lose the county final. The, that would just be so them at the moment. They look. After that performance, you think they're going to be hard to stop, and they are. And Jake Morris looked unbelievable. And as the as the game progressed, I thought to myself, "This lad will get starting for Tipperary in the championship this year." Now, when he started last year in the Munster final against Limerick, didn't go so well, but he seems to have beefed up a bit. His finishing was just lovely. Like I mean, he got a ball early, narrow angle, top corner, very Lara Corbett esque. Got another one a few minutes later, in low in past the goalkeeper buried the penalty he looked class and actually I mentioned Larry Corbett he came on after 24 minutes and he actually did a couple of decent things I think he, he won a free and it might have been right before half time that Thurless finally got their first score of the game but he was really good well in, in terms of what else they were producing in that forward line because um, like losing Billy McCarthy it can't be explained away as losing Billy McCarthy because all of a sudden they were robbed of one ball winner. You have six forwards and they're all supposed to be able to try and win their own ball. But it did feel like it came back to that cl- cliche of having too many nippy little forwards and not a l- enough lads to win the ball. Now Dennis Maher did win a few balls, but other than that, and maybe Lar, it just didn't really happen. I wonder will this be Lar's last game because he'll, pr- he'll be 40 the next time the club championship comes around. So will, be th- will this be the last we see of Lar? Yeah, it's funny because I'd say what I'm not I'm not trying to say what's in his head, but I'd say after being beaten the last couple of years, I'd say he didn't want to end on a sour note and they thought they were underachieving and they were over over the last couple of years. There's no point in saying any different. But um yeah, it it, it it could well be and the funny thing is he'd been flying it still. He'd been coming on and having a massive, massive impact in games. Would I be right in saying that Nina also stunned Turles in a semi final a couple of years ago? Was it 18 they beat them in the semi-final? I think they did. I think that was way. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Someone, someone will correct us if we got that wrong, but I think I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, so like, oh, the pressure now goes on to Nina. You know, they've beaten probably the favourites for the championship. Um, it's it's funny, like, and you go down through, you go down through the Nina team and just see all the talent that they have there. There's, there's no reason why they shouldn't be... Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be winning the county title. I think they're waiting since ninety three to win, to win a, to, uh, Is that Padre Whelan was actually over them, over them that year? Funny enough, the the might the man with the Midas touch, but um, like, yeah, it's it's a bit, it's a big, it's a big one for them now. They need they need to kick on. They're after taking a scalp, but say everybody is happy. Everybody's happy that Turtles is gone, and probably a lot of people are happy that Boris are gone. Two of the bigger, bigger, bigger hitters. So um, it's just a matter of need need to kick on now. Yeah, and like I mentioned the fact that Billy McCarthy was out, but Ronan Maher, he had to go back full back pretty quickly when Jake Morris was causing an awful lot of bother. Paddy Maher didn't have the influence he'd normally have. It wasn't probably his greatest game, but 
the thing that stood out about Nina was how they hunted in packs. And this is the thing, they're, they're thought of as, you know, the flaky town team at times, you know, when it's really put up to them. But this was a serious performance. Tommy Heffernan was on fire in the full forward line. Just jinking about when he got the ball in his hand, people couldn't get really get near him. He had a couple of wides, but generally he was fairly sensational. What also stood out then was that they had to put... Hugh Maloney went off just before half time, and he was a big loss at full back because Barry Heffernan, who had been lording it at centre back, and I mean he was just sweeping over and back. He collect the ball. He's such a big man. He'd run through two or three lads, winner free. You know that sort of thing. That if you run into a tackle and you get held up, you're probably going to get done for steps. But he keeps the forward momentum going. So you have lads hanging out of him, and he's still trying to get the you know the hand pass away overhand. Um, and if he was missing for the semi final now. That'd be a bit of a concern because he had to go back full back and Dennis Maher snapped the ball over him and did a beautiful little sort of pirouette um, goal into the net. So that'd be a concern for them. Uh, Ronan got a red at the end and Paddy ended up in the full forward line with him. That'll tell you how disjointed or how much kind of Thurless had to just rip up the script by the end of the game. So 3-12 to 1-8. And I wonder is that kind of the last of Thurless? It's so funny considering we were only saying a week or two ago that they looked like Everton was going to click and they were going to be county champions again. But now all of a but sudden... But if you compare, Shane, like 1-8 to 2-25, like this is a... It's a they're poles apart with the performances earlier on in the, in the championship. You know, Blitz and Killer on in the last quarter to really like a limp performance and only scoring after 29 minutes the other day. They are, they are poles apart. So the writing did look like it was on the wall, like they were going to bounce back and we were going to see the turtles of all, but it just didn't materialise. Yeah, absolutely. Move on to the next game then. Uh, Lockmore Castellani against Clonolty Ross, Ross Moore. And for the Lockmore people, that's why I'm ma- wearing the Mayo jersey here to sort of a little bit of a tribute to their performance the we- over the weekend. A little bit of a tribute, or Boris and Lee are going out of championships so here, nailing their colours to another <laughs> mast. I uh, know, they were, they were good here because Clonolty, they actually struggled to really impose themselves in this game. I think Timmy Hammersley was pretty good. Dylan Quirk never really got going. Cahill Burke didn't really get going. John O'Keefe didn't take over from centre back the way you'd expect he did. Just weren't really that good. And the thing about Lockmore is that it's not as if Noel McGrath and John McGrath were unbelievably sensational. They were both good. They were both decent. Um, and probably if it was someone who didn't have their names, you'd be saying, geez, they were very good. But you know that they can produce an awful lot more. And to win by seven points, 221 to 20 points, and not really ever feel like you've hit top gear. They're in a good place there, and that's why Nina might be a little bit concerned. And if John McGrath is going, going to go full forward for the next game, and Hugh Maloney isn't available, and therefore Barry Heffernan has to go back to mark him, I think Lockmore can cause them some, some difficulty. Conor McGrath had a big impact coming in. He, kind of, he set up a goal with a lovely crossfield ball over the top. He was running out to the corner, dragged the full, full back line out with him, and someone else came through from the half forward line, nailed it into the net. Uh, They're that, in a good spot, Kieran Shane, in the sense that Evan Sweeney stepped up one day, Kieran McGrath steps up this day. They have yeah. lads, like if, if John and Noel were talking about, if they do click and they hit three or four from play each or John McGrath gets in for one two or one three and there's still a couple of lads chipping in there they'll be in business like to put up a huge score all considered I chatted to Frankie Frankie McGrath after the last day against Killer Ann and he said the real focus was on their defence you can see the 2-12 against Killer Ann which isn't bad and 20 points the other day in a high scoring game again no goal so I think um like they're going week on week now they're six or seven weeks in a row now between hurling and football they have a football semi-final coming up soon uh, they're kept busy but it seems to be working for them yeah and David Kennedy's still in goals at 43 Stephen Gleeson at Tip FM was tweeting remarkable longevity now in playing careers in Hurling this weekend Tipperary Hurling legends that won in All-Ireland in 2001 are all key for their clubs David Kennedy Lockmore Lara for Sarsfields Owen Kelly for Mullinahone and Brendan Cummins with Bally Bacon that they're all talking out and he goes by, par- by comparison from 1991 it's highly unlikely any of the tip players from the All-Ireland win in 1971 were still talking out longevity of careers has been a huge positive development in Hurling it strengthens the playing pool adds experience and increases the, the numbers playing now Henry Martin replied take a look at the Patrick's Well team beaten in the 1991 All-Ireland Club final Sean Foley and Leonard, Leonard Enright 
and they've been won, won a league I think with Limerick in 71 and then Tony Doran won an All-Ireland club in 1989 after winning an All-Ireland in 1968 so uh, he's a special case too winning at, an, at 43 years of age winning that club All-Ireland am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah I think he was brilliant the same day as well he got he got a handful of scores the same day I just think nowadays like how many Cruciates finished lads careers back in the day? Oh it was uh, one and done it was one and done back then you know what I mean? Like, uh, he hurt his knee. He didn't know what it was, but he hurt his knee and he wasn't able to run. He wasn't able to turn, basically, anymore. I think lads are more likely to keep themselves in a condition, um, you know, where they'd be able to still play now. You know, lads back then, without being smart, it was a kind of a, a, di- a different lifestyle, maybe. They're, they weren't as, you know, it's physical fitness almost now, and keeping fit now is like, a massive part of your lifestyle not just hurling or whatever it's a massive thing lads are lads are still in good shape in their 40s now like i'm sure there's lads in kula I'm sure there's lads in boris there's definitely lads in borough where you're thinking jesus keeps himself in great shape i don't think there would be a good handful of lads now that could still play in their 40s no problem i don't think it would you would have been saying that as much now uh back in the day maybe did maybe they slip back hurt in junior and maybe kind of slip away or whatever but um, it's, it's, it's a great thing really it's good that injuries don't tend to finish careers as much now as they used to as well yeah like even my late 30s I find it, it can be very difficult some weeks to to be right to play but then a physio might find a little trick and all of a sudden you're back on the field again I've definitely had that a few times where you're thinking oh give up the ghost here and maybe some people would uh, double down and say yeah you should give up the ghost but at the same time Physios can work wonders on you, and you'd wonder 20 or 30 years ago, the amount of guys who, I don't know, they had to give up just because of a niggling hamstring injury that wouldn't go away, that a bit of modern science and preparation would have sorted out for them in a jiffy. I know I once missed um, a quarter final there in 2011 because of something that a foam roller would have fixed. You know, uh, and that's just the, the preparation then versus now, and maybe that's poor on my behalf, but you know you just probably just didn't get the right advice at the right time and there's so many lads that i know had niggling ham- hamstring injuries i'm sure you do too but i mean that's that's the beauty of it these days lads are able to play for longer right the biggest uh, drama of the weekend i think had to come in the drum and inch burst lee match so this finished 419 to 128 after 80 minutes that's two periods of 10 minutes extra time and drum and inch eventually won 3-1 on penalties owen collins has to be the hero of the game he saved a penalty during normal time. Actually, late on, Brendan Maher had a chance to win the game with a penalty. Owen Collins saves it. Then during the penalty shootout, where only four of the eight penalties were scored, Collins saves two, and Burris Lee got knocked out. And do you know what the thing for Collins is? He'd, he'd made a few mistakes in the Kiladangan game. I'd only seen the scoreline, and I'd see Kiladangan had beaten them 4-15 to 18 points, if I remember correctly. And... Few people have told me since that all four goals you could nearly trace back to Collins. So it's like what a turnaround in such a short space of time to go from villain, albeit not that strongly, to, you know, he's not that much of a villain, to end up being the hero. What a day for him and, and all a tip watching. Yeah, it's totally forgotten about. It's amazing. Like pe- people often get down even during matches, like things aren't going well, but you are literally only one ball away from being a hero or one ball away from having a good game. Like you just say, if you're playing a county final in the morning and you're brutal for 40 minutes and you suddenly like catch a ball and set up a goal, like everything that came before that in the in the, the 50 years that follow when that match has been recalled, they, don't, they won't say, oh, Stapleton was playing terrible up until that. They say, ah, the great catch, and he set up the goal. Actually, we wouldn't have won a county final only, only for him. Do you know what I mean? You're ever, you're only ever like one, you know, one ball or another game away from playing well. So I think James Woodlock said after as well that he, he kind of seemed to think that, that Collins wasn't far off, uh, been in contention for, you know, been on a tip panel as well. But some drama, in fairness, like Boris Ali just seemed to bring that drama with them, like the whole way through the campaign last year, through that dramatic Munster final, unbelievable All Ireland semi final. But they will be disappointed to go out. Like, you just can talk me through that game. Like, what, should Boris have won it in normal time, or were they ahead, were they were they were ahead a bit in extra time? Or they just talk me through it a little bit there. Yeah, I think Boris Lee would be very very disappointed to get knocked out at this stage of the competition. Now, injuries have definitely been a bit of a problem. Like last year, everything fell perfectly for Boris Lee. Now there was one man who had a crucial, but other than that, it felt like anything that could go right for Boris Lee more or less did go right. Whereas they probably feel like things went wrong here. At the same time, you can't be conceding four goals. Now, my brother Paddy Stavelton wasn't playing full-back, came on in the game. So obviously to not have your full-back is not ideal. And maybe some of that, you can, you can trace some of that back. 
also Kieran Maher wasn't fit to start the game that's another very important guy who's who's been very very good but conceding the four goals just was a little bit crazy and I think one of them that like Bursley were, were five points up towards the end of normal time having not played unbelievably well it, it always seemed like they had an extra gear to kick on past drum but too much of this long ball aimlessly up the field and trying to hit Niall Kenny which I can understand and he caught one uh, brilliant one at the start and one brilliant one in the second half where he turned and tried to run in and bat it in and didn't quite get the goal and he can be really effective but if you keep going long ball long ball long ball you miss out on hitting the short ones to whether it's Jerry Kelly whether it's Kieran Maher sorry Kevin Maher whether it's JD Devaney you're not getting in them them into the game enough so I think Boris Lee didn't help themselves in that sort of sense but at the same time they were five points up late on then uh, Seamus Callanan had a free that was moved up because someone started jawing at the referee he goes for a top spin shot isn't stopped I think the sun was low and might have caught out the goalkeeper and the defenders on the line but that all of a sudden drum her back into it then drum get another goal and then we're going to extra time now John Campion had come on as a sub for drum and he was brilliant he came just streaming up the centre scoring points and then Burris Lee had, uh, had the game in control again and uh, the fourth goal came it was a free out for Burris Lee right one of the I think it was David Butler had sort of left the hurley in on James McCormick as he was coming out the goalkeeper and referee blew a free but James McCormick turned and blasted the ball at David Butler which it didn't hit him but Fergal Horgan is of course going to give a throw ball rock on the 21 ball spills back in towards the Burris goal David Butler kicks it into the net Burris Lee put themselves in bother but at the same time the drama continues Brendan Maher has a penalty which would put Burris from a point behind to two points ahead gets saved and I see people complaining that Fergal Horgan let Burris Lee out of jail because there was a lot of uh, injury time played in normal time which allowed an equaliser which was um, w which obviously yeah Burris Lee got back and the same in extra time and I think it was Dan McCormick who scored a brilliant uh, leveller that might have been in, in normal time it, it, so much happened it's hard to remember which way it happened then it went to penalties and just it was pr like to me the guys who were stepping up for drum seemed more comfortable to take penalties and you know like David Butler I thought yeah he's going to score Seamus Callanan he's going to score whereas I th thought the Burris lads I was, I was even looking at it when they were lining up before him and I was like which of these is going to score and I was a bit unsure if they would and to be honest who practices penalties the odd lad like in training beforehand you'll have the odd lad practicing penalties but in general it doesn't really happen so it's tough on players Funny as well when Brenda when Brenda Matter is the free taker for Boris Lee, you have a back as your main free taker. So I don't know how many lads would in the forwards then would be comfortable if they're not that comfortable that they'd be hitting frees in normal time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's actually it, to bring a back up hitting frees is actually a nuisance to some extent. So maybe it would make sense that they wouldn't be as comfortable hitting penalties then if they're not comfortable hitting frees. Yeah. By the way, I probably should make more of the fact that Drum played really well and used the ball very well throughout. And like Shame, Shame's Callanan scored one nine one six from frees. And Ray McCormick stayed with him really, really well for a lot of the game and actually scored a point going in the other direction. But there are times when Callan, you just he gets a ball in his hand and all you have to do is just make sure he doesn't get a goal, let him tap it over the bar. But I thought Drum were very good and they used their subs very well and they made more of an impact. Um, for Brendan Maher, it's funny, like he scored some unbelievable frees throughout this game, pressure frees. And actually, yeah, one of them took the game, two penalties. And like he, he really kind of drove into the game in extra time. And Drum had done really well to not puck aimless ball down on top of Dan McCormick and Brendan Maher and allow them to control the game. So that was definitely a triumph from their point of view. But for Brendan, it's, it's funny, he's, he had such a big impact on the game and then he has a penalty saved both at the end of the game and then in the penalty shootout, which ultimately allows Drum to win. So he's going to go away with ter terrible memories from this game, even though he'd actually had a huge positive impact. So that's kind of the fine lines in it. Um, what do you make of um, what do you make of penalties as a way of deciding mm. games like this? There's not really uh, they want to get finished on the day. How it's obviously unbelievably traumatic, particularly if you're not involved with either of the clubs. Uh, what do you what do you think of that? What do you think it is a fair way to finish a game? I, look, I think it's fine. I I mean maybe if you wanted to go for two more sets of five minutes, then of course like would Drum pick up some injuries? You know, Drum are the team that got through, and Seamus Callan had to get his calf strapped at one stage, so maybe that was cramp is he now going to somewhat go into the semi-final there's a bit of a doubt the semi-final that's going to be against um against Killadangan. 
So I, I would worry from that point of view. But penalties, I, I don't really have that big of an issue. Because Bursley had 80 minutes to win that game. They, they were five points up going into injury time of normal time. They had a penalty at the end of extra time. They easily could have won this game. But you didn't get it done. So, I mean, that's life. And people will say, oh, no, it's unfair on the people who missed the penalties and all that kind of stuff. But, like, there's lads who make mistakes that everyone has seen. You made those mistakes or you missed that chance. That's just the way it is. That's life. That's hurling. That's growing up. That's adults. You just have to accept it. What do you think? Uh, it's, I see a, sh- a tweet from Shane Brophy, and I know you've kind of been an advocate for it before. He just said, while penalty shootouts are dramatic, it's a cruel way to lose, and I would not like to see them long term. Next score wins would be fair, as we did in the playground. Um, I'd, ha- I'd, have no, I'd have no problem with, with next score wins. I think it'd be unbelievably dramatic. It could go on. It could go on 10 seconds. It could go on 10 minutes. You don't yeah. know. And it'd be interesting to see, it'd be really interesting to see tactical setups, whether they'd change at all during or something. If someone had a puck out, would it be a real high press? And would you be trying to, you know, force them in to make a mistake? I think that would be interesting as well. I think very fair. If the ball is thrown in at the start and its next score wins, I think it's I think it's unbelievably fair. You'd have lads afraid to pull or give away a free or anything like that. I think it'd be unbelievably dramatic and maybe maybe fair. I think equally uh, in terms of dra- drama compared to penalties. And uh, I think it would probably be even more intriguing, if anything. You'd be very afraid, like, if the game was restarted on a next score win sort of a situation, or a golden score, if you want to call it that, to give it a more glamorous title, that it's going to start with a throw-in in the middle, as it does for every half. You'd be afraid to nearly pull, wouldn't you? Because the last thing you want to do is give away a free instantly to allow the other team to win. Um, so uh, let, let us know what you think. Would you like a golden score? Would you, are you happy with penalties? We'll move on to the Carlo Championship. Uh, Mount Leinster Rangers, they regained the title after their heartbreak last year. Beat Mount Leinster or beat Ballon Killen 321 to 12 points. I was on to Kevin Regan, who covers an awful lot of games out in Carlo, and he said it's as complete a performance as he's seen in a, Car- a Carlo, Ham- um, Carlo final. And he just said it's a shame there's no Leinster because Mount Leinster, they pretty much, you know, they've, they've coasted through this. And, and I've seen some of the results. They dealt with St Mullins fairly handily. They won the semi final against Nave Owen handily enough. And obviously, this is a pretty comprehensive defeat to win, or comprehensive victory to win by 18 points here. Eddie Byrne scored 1 2, Dennis Murphy 2 7, Chris Nolan with 8 points, Ted Joyce added on a point as well. It is, it is a disappointment for them, no more so than Bally Gunner, that there's no provincial championships. Yeah, 100%, particularly if they've been provincial champions before, which they were in 2013. This can often happen. It can go either of two ways for a team that hasn't been in a final for a while. Either the, the occasion is kind of embraced and they really take it on and they push push the you know the you know the bigger kind of team, the more kind of vaunted team to the limits. Or it can happen, maybe it's happened Bally Kill, Ballon Killing yesterday. It just didn't really deliver. We'd be really disappointed and probably be, you know, it's pretty, a tough couple of months kind of just because he didn't deliver uh, anything like their semi final performance against St. Mullins or anything like their group game performance against St. Mullins. But yeah, for for a lot of bigger clubs in a lot of these counties, and there's probably a big, you know, a couple of big clubs in every county in the country, and you're just thinking a county title is unreal for Rangers or whatever. They haven't lost last year and the three in a row stopped. But they would have been in their heads. There would have been a lot of clubs thinking of provincial glory would have been their goal at the start of the year. But uh, so, such as like a, a county title is much better than not at this stage. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder is there going to be a push from some of these clubs that win the county titles and will they band together? And ultimately come out with a statement to the GA saying we want to play the provincials and an all Ireland club series. We want it run during January and early February and just get it done before the league starts. Or even, you know what? By the by, let's say they play the first few rounds of the Leinster, Munster, etc. Sure, by that stage, nearly most of the teams would be knocked out towards the end of January before the league starts. So it would actually just be like business as usual in every other year at the club championship. And uh, I wonder, will there be a wave of momentum to get these club championships going again after Christmas or even before? I don't see, I don't see it happening at this stage. I think they would have had to lobby it all, already at this but stage. But I don't think you could. I don't think the clubs could lobby at this stage because if you, let's say, any club, and you're midway through your club championship and you start rattling the, you know, banging the drum saying, we want a club series, 
uh, an All Ireland club championship, then you're, it's like saying, "Well, we know we've got the club title." I know, but it's, more, it's it. more it's more a statement coming from a county mm-hmm. than a club. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't. I just don't see it. I, um, there's there's no there is no plan in the pipeline for it at the moment. Yeah, and I think I, with all the split season and things that look like they're going to change over the next time, I think this is this kind of this club campaign is just going to have to have an asterisk beside it. Unfortunately, I think it would have had to have been scheduled in. At the start, or some sort of tentative plans for it, in order for it to go ahead, I don't, I don't see it happening. But that would have been funny because, uh, you know, just say Bur- Bur are trying to make sure there's a provincial campaign, and every club in Offaly will be against Bur. Bur think they're going to win the camp. You know, it's just yeah. it's cannon fodder. It's ideal motivation for everybody else. Absolutely, yeah. And let us know what you think on that. So the Kilkenny Championship this weekend. Now we had one Keith Hogan tweet already. He's been on the rampage <laughs> this weekend. To be fair to him, the Clara man. And he goes, so at the weekend in Kilkenny Club games, TJ Reid scored 116, Richie Hogan scored 16 points, John Walsh scored 213. Not much said about it. Can you imagine if Joe Canning scored that at the weekend? You couldn't open your web browser without it being shoved in your face. What do you make of that? Do we not make enough of uh, the Kilkenny men here on our game? No, I think we do, to be fair. Um, I think maybe it, might, it mightn't get the... I think because they were preliminary quarterfinals, maybe, and not, you know, a big knockout game. A lot of people, you have to be fair, a lot of people are only seeing what, what's on TV or seeing some big score that someone puts up on TV or if there's kind of clips going around. There was phenomenal scoring this weekend, though. And it just shows you as well, um, when club players are given, you know, any sort of a decent kind of a sod, uh, and the, the opportunities are there. Like Richie Hogan, 16 points, I think seven or eight from play. TJ hit one nine from play. I think John Walsh scored two eight out of two thirteen from play. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, Keith Hogan. This was obviously the first weekend that Clara have been playing in a while, so he must have decided to take to Twitter rather than because he couldn't take to the pitch this weekend. He decided to take to Twitter. I don't think I think there's some validity in in what he's saying, but I think it's just more maybe because those games were in the in the background a little bit more this weekend. Yeah. So just to run through the fixtures, Bennett's Bridge beats Greg Bally Callan twenty points to one fifteen. Uh, David Blanchfield, Jam- uh, Jamie Hark and Sean Morrissey in the, in the Morrissey. I think they'd stood up in the game. But it was a case of Conor Murphy freeze keeping Greg Ballycallan in it and he got a goal towards the end to, to make the game probably look a little bit closer than it was. Yeah, I, it was it was close enough. I probably thought I'd be a lot more comfortable for the bridge. Having Billy Ryan back was massive. I think his, uh, his younger brother Sean was very good and Tommy, Tommy Rowan and Adrian Rowan's son was good. And the Morrissey has switched up to centre forward uh, with his brother Sean. Sean's gone back centre back. I believe the two of them were pretty good at the weekend. Um, just from chatting a couple of people that watched the, the stream in the game, David Blanchfield was outstanding. And by all accounts, um, if it's not this year, at the end of this year, he'll be he'll be in with Emma Kilkenny. He's a big range. He's about six three or six four. He's a big lad. I've ever seen him play in the Leinster under twenty final with Kilkenny last year. Uh, the bridge are the bridge are just tipping away in ice state. They're they're exactly where they thought they'd be and where they'd want to be. Um, then like we talked about the other one of the other preliminary quarterfinals, Tuller Owen were beaten by a point, Aaron's own two eighteen, Tuller Owen one twenty. So like Tuller Owen had that kind of horrible passage through where they played the Red Non Ireland champions and drew with them and then they were beaten by the village and then they were beaten by the bridge. And they were coming up against a really kind of battle hardened hardened Aaron zone. I didn't think it'd be this type of scoreline, but honest with you, I thought I thought it'd be I thought it'd be much tighter. But I believe the the Aaron zone uh, Comer defence was outstanding. Kieran Wallace at full back and Connor Delaney at centre back. And at the other end of the field, I think Tommy Walsh, young Tommy Walsh was outstanding for Tuller Owen. But uh, yeah, Aaron Zone are going to be ha- going to be hard beaten in the quarter final. You know exactly what you're going to get from them. Uh, that was a really tight game, but the next game was anything but tight. They had Bally Hale Shamrocks four thirty four. The roar in a stig eight points, which is yeah. I listen. Do you know what though about about that scoreline? Like around the country, people would have seen that, and you know, TJ Reid puts up massive scoreline and all that, which of course is all positive to Bally Hale that you wouldn't try and take away from. But you'd almost feel sorry for the roar in a stig because the sort of um, I don't know. There's a, there's obviously a bad taste from a, a defeat of that magnitude, but most of the country wouldn't realise that they were missing the majority of their very strong players. So that probably wouldn't be the scoreline. They might have lost the game anyway. Sure, Bally Hale beat most teams, beat nearly everyone. Sure, they're double All-Ireland champions. But it's a very unfair unfair reflection on the roar as a club. Yeah, there's not going to be an asterisk beside it telling everyone, telling everyone what the kind of mitigating circumstances of the result were. They were missing Richie Lai, Joe Ling, Kieran Joyce, uh, Jim Ryan, who was on the Kilkenny Under-20 panel. It was a, it's an absolute horror show for them. Um, 
maybe some of those injuries might be able to be back for the relegation semi-final that they're going to have uh, this weekend but they, they are under pressure and it's going to be hard to, to pick things back up and in the, la- the last preliminary quarter final is an absolute belter of a game and uh, again the scoreline is probably deceiving uh, it was after extra time it was Mullen of 527 Dainsford 125 so by all accounts Dainsford could and should have won in normal time as I said earlier on Richie Hogan was unreal he'd, uh, he'd 6 or 7 from play from midfield Paddy Hogan his brother got a goal uh, John Walsh kind of kept them in it. Um, John Walsh is an interesting one. That that clip that you put up on earlier on in the year, the kind of look, the, the no look flick into the wall. That was that was actually John Walsh from from Mull uh, He's unbelievably skillful. He's one of the only ones from that 2014 All Ireland winning team, All Ireland minor winning team that hasn't got a real shot with Kilkenny. I think he missed them um, in the first. 65 kind of shootout in the Walsh Cup final. I think he missed the 65 that day, and I don't think I think he was let go from the panel not long after. But if you look at the rest of that minor panel, he scored two five in that final. But if you look at the rest of that panel, they nearly all got a good shot. Um, the likes of Darren Mullen, uh, Connor Brown, there's loads more. If you go through them all, they nearly all got a shot, and he hasn't. And he's clearly got an awful lot of talent. Mm. Like if you're putting up two five or two eight from play, I believe a good bit of it was off Paul Murphy as well. So maybe there's a lad that could that could benefit maybe uh, in club action, but they Dainsford missed their chance. They missed their chance. You know, do you know when a team has a chance in normal time and you just know they've spent, they've given everything, yeah. and maybe Richie Hogan has given everything, and him going in and playing a game in extra time is probably not exactly ideal for his body as well. But it's great to hear that he's flying and uh, on the back. Probably there is probably they're probably the results we all thought. But just there was there. Some of them were probably a bit tired than we thought. I'd say, and a couple of interesting quarterfinals: James Stevens against Mullinavat, O'Loughlin Gales and Aaron Zone, Dixborough against Bennett's Bridge and Clara and Ballyhale. Like they're all, they're all hard call to some extent. You wouldn't be surprised. Um, you wouldn't be surprised if the either of the sides were able to win it. Probably Clara and Ballyhale. Clara haven't been going on real well. I know they won the, the Shield final, but you'd still fancy Ballyhale. Of the other three, I'd probably call James Stevens. All Lachlan's and Dixborough, but he wouldn't be that surprised if there was an upset or two there. No more than the Tip Championship this weekend. Yeah, and Keith Hogan, of course, will. Uh, he's been talking about <laughs> TJ Reid. He'll get a fair taste of him very soon in that quarter final. So interesting to see how that goes for him. Uh, in the intermediate and Downey's Bally Ragged, they were knocked out on penalties by Goran. Uh, Kevin Kelly scored a penalty and then missed one in sudden death. And Richie Powers, uh, Carrick Shock, they were beaten by St. Martins and Muckalee, who were led by John Mulhall. And a bit like John Walsh from Mulnavat, maybe a bit of his free spirit. And I mean, I'd be curious to know what people think. Is that the reason that that uh, they're not involved with, with Kilkenny? That Brian Cody likes guys who are straight and by the numbers, the sort of army type uh, characters who dependable every single day whereas these lads may be more mercurial one day they could score you 215 2-8 from play and then the next day it may be not be quite as uh, dependable but uh, yeah, let yeah John, John Mulhall would be a very dependable man if it comes to a beer pong championship he, he famously uh, represented Ireland in the world beer pong championship in Las Vegas he's uh, uh, Mulhall's a, a great character yeah and he obviously sang the song the Tipperary Paul Mahone after the 2011 yeah. All-Ireland as well he didn't see too much game time thereafter but yeah great characters and great hurlers on the day as well yeah the Galway championship at the weekend so it, this is where the senior A meets senior B, and so we had a lot of clashes there. And and to be honest, the, probably the biggest drama of the weekend came for Ahaskar a Fahina, and they had basically gotten up to senior A through getting a couple of late goals and Park Park Mannion scoring one of those recently. Was that against Orn Marie? Orn Moore Marie? I think it might. No, Mullia. The last Mullia, thing they Mullia. basically got it was a pure smash and grab job at the end. Mullia looked in control. They got two goals. The keeper took one down with his hurl and Mannion came in and flicked it in and then they got another goal nearly straight after. And it was nearly the exact same this weekend. I was chatting to Patrick Early there, the freelance down in, down in Galway. He went through the whole detail of it. And uh, it's funny now when you're a journalist at a match and I could tell even from his voice, you have to be able to convey exactly what happened because you're telling so many people about what happened anyone who's didn't watch the stream and I could tell he was absolutely buzzing even, even talking about it. So basically, Crockwell were... Two nine to six points up after thirty three minutes. Uh, a Hasgra were slowly kind of chipping away. Obviously, a Hasgra as well. I don't know about you. Do you remember the don't feed the gondolas? I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tom, Sean Moncrief used to be Monica. Monica Lully from a little town in the west of Ireland called a Graw. He used to do this prank call thing at the end of the show, but that's immediately what I think of when I think of a Hasgra. A Hasgra were chipping away at a hole at the back, and then. Um, 
they butchered a free, I think, when they were two or three down, and Crockwell went down the other end, and they were four up. Then, like, they were, I think it was four up, and then they went five up. Then, like, bam, right, in injury time, John Finnerty, who had went off, Sean Blaheen had to go off injured, uh, Finnerty came on, doubled on a ball, real old school, like, 1990 stuff, a lovely double on it, and then... The next ball in, I think Carl Mannion put it in from about 30 or 40 yards out. He well, well back. And Parik Mannion, who plays in the forwards for Hasker, I think he started full forward. He The ball ended up with him. And I love this. Uh, one of the forwards in Hasker got the ball and he was about 25 yards out. And his first thing was, where is Parik Mannion? Get the ball to him. Got it out to him. And an absolute rasper from just out the side. Uh, brilliant shot. About 25 yards out, I'd say, as well. And thereafter, snatching... Uh, a win from the jaws of defeat two weeks in a row and having this in just their first quarter final since amalgamation I think something like 20 years ago it's an unbelievable achievement because I don't think anybody would have uh, would have expected to, to be in this position and it's, it's some difference when you have players of the quality of Colin Mannion and Parik Mannion and, and Sean Blahan is he's kind of stepping up for the county too and looks like he might get um, get some game time there Colin Mannion we talked about him in the best ball striker uh, when we were doing that series and we like I would say that Park Mannion is arguably the best leader that the county team has. So to have that at club level is unreal. No, oh, it's savage, yeah. You're probably looking at Park Mannion or, or Joe Canning realistically in the last couple of years. Lads that just seem to take games by the scruff of the neck and he's obviously you know these lads just make things happen. Like they don't wait for things to happen, they just make things happen. Um there was a there was another there was another there was another brilliant Mellows and Gart and uh, I was following the game on Twitter and Gart went into a 4-0 lead and then kind of Mellows just totally took over but then Gart took over in the last quarter so Jack Ford who's a, a converted goalie him and Adrian Morrissey scored four apiece uh, for Mellows Mellows were in control for 40-45 minutes and then Aidan Hellebert basically took control of the game for Gart and Gart were missing Aidan Hart who's out with him hamstring injury so that's a massive loss you're missing your, your big county player Gart clawed their way back into it uh, and had a, got a penalty to go up one up I think it was stopped Greg Laddie's penalty was stopped and then it was bundled over the line and I think Hellebert missed a free and it's like he scored 12 seven frees one line ball and he was outstanding and probably the main man that brought them back into it but I think he missed a free that he would normally score and Ty Caron put over two frees for Gart to win the game Angus Callanan again brilliant scored two goals scored two goals in the first half for Mellows and Mellows are so battled hard now at this stage they just know how to get a result obviously beaten in the last two two county finals um, and they've had some tough games the whole way through they were beaten by Turlock in the first first game but they're really, really battle hardened and they're going to be hard beat. David Collins obviously still going strong with them. Uh, Connor Cavan up front as well. But they're going to be really hard beat. But they were definitely the two standout preliminary quarterfinals. The uh, the other two were Sarsfields 417, Ardrahan 19. No Johnny Glynn for Ardrahan. Hasn't played for Ardrahan at all this year. Um, I know there was, he apparently had got the transfer back, but. I, I believe he'd been kicking football out, out in New York so that I don't know if that transfer was a bit of a smoke screen I'm not sure um, Kinnadim and Leitrim 22 Baha 115 so the quarter final draw that goes ahead this weekend Capitagal and Ahaskra and Ahaskra will fancy themselves there and Capitagal will have to be 9 or 10 up going into injury time to be safe against them Turlock Moore and Sarsfields Thomas is in Climber Daly Liam Mellows and Lock Gray like it's funny none of them stand out as been unbelievable games but maybe a couple of them didn't stand out the preliminary games didn't stand out this weekend but you would be expecting Mellows Thomas's Turlock Moore and probably Capitagal who were in the semi-finals the last two years beaten by a point to go through but uh, yeah get really really heating up there yeah yeah it's, it's not yeah, exactly it's, a star lineup going into that quarter-final draw I mean without Portumna being the team that they were and now they're going down to senior B and lost their group games by an average of 21 points per day yeah I don't, I don't know if that's like a star studded lineup for the quarter final but maybe the likes of Turlock Moore will be one of those teams that really does establish itself because they look like they have the talent but anyway it remains to be seen how that goes because there's nothing uh, there's nothing certain and I'd imagine that they'll be pretty t- uh, close games the Antrim quarter finals this weekend so there's the there's a couple of teams already in the semi-finals and in the quarterfinals we've been played this weekend after group stages. Nave Owen, they be- beat St. Gauls by four points, 116 to 15 points. And then the shock of the weekend, certainly up there, not necessarily because O'Donovan Rossa haven't been playing well, they have and there's been signs of it, but still in all, 2018 champions Cushendall are out. 
2-11 to O'Donovan Rasa, 16 points for Cushendall. Both goals scored by Stephen Beatty with his foot. Now he's a Gaelic footballer and he's been scoring points for them and he has a quarter-final coming up against Cargan before they play the semi-final against Dunloy. But O'Donovan Rasa are looking to win their first title since 2004 and uh, yeah, both goals with his foot from the Gaelic footballer. That is quite a shock, isn't it? Because Cushendall, you just think the muscle memory of being a successful team that it would get them through against O'Donovan Rasa, but not so. No, one of the big powerhouses. I was actually looking at even the odds last weekend. O'Donovan Rossa were massive underdogs going into that game. And while you said as well, they were going well coming into it. You just don't think maybe that they're going to be able to take out a big gun like they did. But uh, like when a lad is scoring two goals with his feet, you kind of know things are probably going right for you, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to put those videos underneath the art or during the or in the article on our game that I so you can have a look. He fairly buried him actually too. To be fair to him. The Offaly Championship over the weekend, so your game with, uh, again, Burr against uh, Sheer Kieran or Clarine, that was put off because of the bereavement, and that'll be refixed for next Saturday. But some of the other games, St. Ryan has beat Balnamir 219-18, to Kilcormac Kalahi just see, see, um, saw off to Cool Derry 123-122, to and Belmont beat Shin Roan 222-21 to points, so a big weekend in Offaly there. Yeah, I kind of thought Balnamir would run Reynas relatively close, ran him close enough in a group game last year. Reynas kind of all, always had them at arm's length, the reigning champions, obviously. But Balnamir definitely an up and coming side and awfully. Uh, Kilcormick were 16 9 up on Kuleri and looked like they were in control. But Kuleri kind of, as is their want, just kept hanging on in there. Uh, Kevin Brady came on, very experienced, made a massive, massive difference. Daniel Miller, I think, scored 1 4 for Kuleri. And it looked like they were going to get something out of a game that they didn't really have any right to in, in, in many respects but the Kilcormick just uh, just held on the two Kylies uh, good for Kilcormick but Kuleri it's amazing when you have a bit of experience at club level they were just able to keep clawing away and clawing away and you were wondering how they were still in this game but they made it cut out right down to the wire like they normally do uh, Belmont who had been beaten in the first round uh, by they were beaten by Rhinus in the first round they got a win over Shinron who drew in the first round uh, Oshin Kelly outstanding I believe for Belmont and it's interesting so in their group you have, you have Rhinus on four Belmont on two Shinron on one and Balnamir on one so probably apart from Rhinus the other three can still kind of all overtake each other and in the last on the last day you have Belmont against Balnamir and Rhinus against Shinron so it could be like both games are going to be really really interesting as I said our game with Sir Cairn um, was postponed due to a bereavement uh Rose Connors, uh, mother of Chris Connors, who plays with Clarine, I'd just like to offer our sympathies, uh, sympathies to everyone in Borough, um, out to every, the Connors and Clarine. That game is refixed for Saturday evening. And again, that's a massive game as well, because Kuleri, Kuleri are beaten, so Kuleri are on two points. So if Bur who have the winners of Burr and Sir Cairn, if there is a winner, will be on two and we'll join them. If it's us, we play Kuleri in the last game for a uh, place in the last four and if it's Clarine they'll be playing Kilcormick in the last game a Kilcormick team that's already true so loads to play for there absolutely um, so I think that's it for uh, Club Talk Hurling for this Monday brought to you by orgaretro.com if you want to get these jerseys or the Mayo jersey here the Cork jersey that Michael Verney has there with Cork across the front of it or any other classic jersey go to orgaretro.com and put in the promo code our game and you'll get 50 hold on a off. second now Shane hold on a second now I'm wearing a Cork jersey here and we need to go talk a few true a few Cork results Black oh Rock, God almighty Black how do I forget them yeah you're all right. I, I have it. I have the Cork gig. I know you're mm. you're uh, trying to oppress Cork any chance you get, but I definitely have to bring it up. Uh, Black Rock four fifteen, Bishopstown eighteen, Black Rock Black Rock go through. Aaron's own two fifteen, Newtown Chandra one eighteen. Aaron's own go through. Own Hero Murphy top scoring for them. Glen Rovers are already were as good as true. They beat the Pierce well two twenty one to twelve. Simon Kennefick was good there. Douglas. 22 Middleton 118 so we're kind of looking for a statement from Douglas and this is probably it it was a do or die game they had to win to go through Alan Cadigan scored 5 points uh, I think Owen Cadigan was centre back and got a point as well they have Brian Turnbull as well as well as Shane Kingston mm. so maybe they might deliver on kind of what we talked about and I think they have Black, Rock next, they have Black Rock next and they'll fancy yeah. that too 
Yeah, and then the, the other two games, Sarsfields 231, Ballyhay 115, uh, St. Finbars 325, Carrick Tool uh, 10 points. So they're kind of sorting themselves out in Cork. There's a couple of other games even in other counties as well. Derry Senior Ireland Championship, uh, an easy win for Kevin Lynch's 323, Ballinas Stream 9 points, Schlock Neal, as would be expected, 533, Swatra 8 points, Donegal Senior Ireland Championship, St. Eunan's, Letter Kenny 317, Port 116, Down Senior Hurling Championship, Port of Ferry 325, Breda 117, Bally Gallagher 313, Bally Cran 17 points. And there was a couple in the Leash Championship as well. Massive win, um, massive win for Rose and Alice. Uh, we, we did our, my power rankings um, ended up being thrown back on my face because I c- camera us up one or two in it. And Rose and Alice beat them 220 to 39. Uh, John O'Loughlin transferred back. Uh, this year from Dublin, so he was playing up in Dublin the last number of years. It's nearly since he was in college here. With transferred to uh, Rose and Alice, yeah, and he got he got a goal mm-hmm. and was very very instrumental. And they were it wasn't like they were leading the whole way; they were always in control in that game. Uh, comfortable win for Rat Downey Arrow three thirty to Castlehouse nine points. Clock Balakala four eighteen. Abby Leakes two fifteen, and a big win for Boris Kilcotton as well six twenty one. Ballin Kill eighteen. Couple of other results there. Longford, Longford Slashers one eleven, Clangish six uh, six points. Sligo, Eastkey five nineteen, Turner Strand seven, Western Gales two fourteen, Calder St Joseph's two eleven, and then just lastly there was a couple of big games in Wicklow. Uh, Bray Emmett's uh, hammered Avondale two twenty eight to one nine. Greystones beat Glenealy three fifteen to two twelve. That means Greystones and Glenealy both go through to the knockout stages. And St. Pat's booked themselves a semi final place with a 112 to 11 points defeat of Kiltegan. So now, if you want these jerseys, go to go to Arga Retro, type in the promo code ARGAME to get 15% off, and don't ever forget the boys from Cork ever again. I'm after letting us down there. Fair play to you for saving the day once again. Cheers, Michael. No bother, Shane.